Chapter 4, The Building of the Savo Bridge During all this troublesome period, the construction of the railway had been going steadily forward, and the first important piece of work which I had commenced on arrival was completed. This was the widening of a rock, cutting through which the railway ran just before it reached the river. In the hurry of pushing on the laying of the line, just enough of the rock had originally been cut away to allow room for an engine to pass, and consequently any material which happened to project outside the wagons or trucks caught on the jagged faces of the cutting. I, saw, I myself saw the door of a guard's van which had been left ajar smashed to atoms in this way, and accordingly I put a gang of rock drillers at work at once, and soon had ample room made for all traffic to pass unimpeded. While this was going on, another gang of men were laying the foundations of a girder bridge, which was to span a gully between this cutting and Savo station. This would have taken too long to erect when the railhead was at the place, so a diversion had been made round it, the temporary track leading down almost to the bed of the Nola and up again on the further side. When the foundations and abutments were ready, the gully was spanned by an iron girder, the slopes leading up to it banked up on either side, and the permanent way laid on an easy grade. Then also a water supply had to be established, and this meant some very pleasant work for me in taking levels up the banks of the river under the cool shade of the palms. While doing this, I often took my camp kit with me, and a luncheon served in the wilds with occasionally a friend to share it, when a friend was available, was delightful. On one occasion in particular, I went a long way up the river and was accompanied by a young member of my staff. The day had been exceedingly hot, and we were both correspondingly tired when our work was finished, so my companion suggested that we should build a raft and float downstream home. I was rather doubtful of the feasibility of the scheme, but nevertheless he decided to give it a trial. Setting to work with our axes, we soon had a raft built, lashing the poles together with the fiber which grows in abundance all over the district. When, I was, when it was finished, we pushed it out of the little backwater where it had been constructed, and the young engineer jumped aboard. All went well until it got out into midstream, when much to my amusement it promptly toppled gracefully over. I helped my friend to scramble quickly up the bank out of reach of possible crocodiles, when none the worse for his ducking, he laughed as heartily as I at the adventure. Except for an occasional relaxation of this sort, every moment of my time was fully occupied. Superintending the various works and a hundred other duties kept me busy all day long, while my evenings were given up to settling disputes among the coolies, hearing reports and complaints from various jemadars and work people, and in studying the Swahili language. Preparations, too, for the principal piece of work in the district, the building of the railway bridge over the Savo River, were going on apace. These involved much personal work on my part. Cross and oblique sections of the river had to be taken. The rate of the current and the volume of water at flood, mean and low levels had to be found, and all the necessary calculations made. These having at length been completed, I marked out the positions for the abutments and piers, and the work of sinking their foundations was begun. The two center piers in particular caused, caused a great deal of trouble, as the river broke in several times and had to be dammed up and pumped dry again before work could be resumed. Then we found we had to sink much deeper than we expected in order to reach a solid foundation. Indeed, the sinking went on and on until I began to despair of finding one and was about to resort to pile driving, when at last, to my relief, we struck solid rock on which the huge foundation stones could be laid with perfect safety. Another great difficulty with which we had to contend was the absence of suitable stone in the neighborhood. It was not that there was none to be found, for the whole district abounds in rock, but that it was intensely hard as to be almost impossible to work, and a bridge built of it would have been very costly. I spent many a weary day trudging through the thorny wilderness, vainly searching for suitable material, and was beginning to think that we should be forced to use iron columns for the piers, when one day I stumbled quite by accident on the very thing. Brock and I were out pot hunting, and hearing some guinea fowl cackling among the bushes, I made a circuit half round them so that Brock, on getting in his shot, could drive them over in my direction. I eventually got into position on the edge of a deep ravine and knelt on one knee, crouching down among the ferns. There I had scarcely time to load when flew over flew a bird, which I missed badly. I did not have another chance, for Brock, Brock had got to work, and being a first-rate shot, had quickly bagged a brace. Meanwhile, I felt the ground very hard under my knee, and on examination found that the bank of the ravine was formed of stone, which extended for some distance, and which was exactly the kind of material for which I had long been fruitlessly searching. I was greatly delighted with my unexpected discovery, 
though at first I had grave misgivings about the distance to be traversed and the difficulty of transporting the stone across the intervening country. Indeed, I found in the end that the only way of getting the material to the place where it was wanted was by laying down a tram line right along the ravine, throwing a temporary bridge across the Savo, following the stream down, and recrossing it again close to the site of the permanent bridge. Accordingly, I set men to work at once to cut down the jungle and prepare a road on which to lay the double trolley line. One morning, when they were thus engaged, a little paw, a kind of very small antelope, sprang out and found itself suddenly in the midst of a gang of coolies. Terrified and confused by the shouting of the men, it ran straight at Sherry Shaw, the Jemadar, who promptly dropped a basket over it and held it fast. I happened to arrive just in time to save the graceful little animal's life and took it home to my camp, where it very soon became a great pet. Indeed, it grew so tame that it would jump upon my table at mealtimes and eat from my hand. When the road for the trolley line was cleared, the next piece of work was the building of the two temporary bridges over the river. These we made in the roughest fashion out of palm trees and logs felled at the crossing places, and had a flood come down, they would, of course, have been both been swept away. Fortunately, however, this did not occur until the permanent work was completed. The whole of this feeding line was finished in a very short time, and trolleys were soon plying backwards and forwards with loads of stone and sand, as we also discovered the latter in abundance and of good quality in the bed of the ravine. An amusing incident occurred one day when I was taking a photograph of an enormous block of stone which was being hauled across one of these temporary bridges. As the trolley with its heavy load required very careful manipulation, my head mason, Hira Singh, stood on the top of the stone to direct operations while the overseer, Persho Tam Herji, superintended the gangs of men who hauled the ropes at either end in order to steady it up and down the inclines. But we did not know that the stream had succeeded in washing away the foundations of one of the log supports. And as the weight of the trolley with the stone came on the undermined pier, the rails tilted up and over went the whole thing into the river, just as I snapped the picture. Here a Singh made a wild spring into the water to get clear of the falling stone, while Pershotam and the rest fled as if for their lives to the bank. It was altogether a most comical sight, and an extraordinary chance at that very moment of the accident I should be taking a photograph of the operation. Fortunately, no one was injured, injured in the slightest, and the stone was recovered undamaged but with little trouble. Not long after this occurrence, my own labors were one day, day nearly brought to a sudden and unpleasant end. I was traveling along in an empty trolley which, pushed by two sturdy pathans, was returning to the quarry for sand. Presently, we came to the sharp incline which led to the log bridge over the river. Here it was the custom of the men, instead of running beside the trolley, to step on it and let its own momentum take it down the slope, moderating its speed when necessary by a brake in the shape of a pole, which one of them carried, and by which the wheels could be locked. On this occasion, however, the pole was by some accident dropped overboard, and the, the down the hill we flew without break of any kind. Near the bridge, there was a sharp curve in the line where I was afraid the trolley would jump the rails. Still, I thought it was better to stick to it than to risk leaping off. A moment afterwards, I felt myself flying head over, first over the edge of the bridge, just missing by a hair's breadth a projecting beam. But luckily, I ended on a, landed on a sandbank at the side of the river, the heavy trolley falling clear of me with a dull, dull thud close by. This accident also was happily unattended by injury to anyone. Chapter 5, Troubles with the Workmen it seemed fated that the building of the Savo Bridge should never be allowed to proceed in peace for any length of time. I have already described our troubles with the lions, and no sooner did the beasts of prey appear to have deserted us, for the time being at any rate, than other troubles, no less serious, arose with the workmen themselves. After I had discovered the stone for the bridge, I sent down to the coast for gangs of masons to work and dress it. The men who were sent to me for this purpose were mostly pathans, and were supposed to be expert workmen but I soon found out that many of them had not the faintest notion of stone cutting and were simply ordinary coolies who had posed as masons in order to draw 45 instead of 12 rupees a month. On discovering this fact, I immediately instituted a system of piecework and drew up a scale of pay which would enable the genuine mason to earn his 45 rupees a month and a little more if he felt inclined and would cut down on the impostors to about their proper pay as coolies. Now, as is often the case in this world, the impostors were greatly in the majority, and accordingly they attempted to intimidate the remainder into coming down to their own standard as regards output of work, in the hope thereby 
of inducing me to abandon the piecework system of payment. This, however, I had no intention of doing, as I knew that I had demanded only a perfectly fair amount of work from each man. These masons were continually having quarrels and fights among themselves, and I had frequently to go down to their camp to quell disturbances and separate the Hindus from the Mohammedans. One particularly, particularly serious disturbance of this sort had a rather amusing sequel. I was sitting after dusk one evening at the door of my hut when I heard a great commotion in the mason's camp, which lay only a few hundred yards away. Presently, a jemadar came rushing up to me to say that the men were all fighting and murdering each other with sticks and stones. I ran back with him at once and succeeded in restoring order, but found seven badly injured men lying stretched out on the ground. These I had carried up to my own boma in Charpoy's native beds. And Brock being away, I had to play the doctor myself as best I could, stitching one and bandaging another and generally doing what was possible. There was one man, however, who groaned loudly and held a cloth over his face, as if he were dying. On lifting this covering, I found him to be a certain mason called Karen Bucks, who was well known to me as the prime mischief maker among the men. I examined him carefully, but as I could discover nothing amiss, I concluded that he must have received some internal injury, and accordingly told him I would send him to the hospital at Boy, about thirty miles down the line, to be attended to properly. He was then carried back to his camp, groaning grievously all the time. Scarcely had he been removed when the head Jemadar came and informed me that the man was not hurt at all, and as the, that as a matter of fact he was the sole cause of the disturbance. He was now pretending to be badly injured in order to escape the punishment which he knew he would receive if I discovered that he was the instigator of the trouble. On hearing this, I gave instructions that he was not to go to Boy in the special train with the others, but I had not heard the last of him yet. About eleven o'clock that night, I was called up and asked to go down to the mason's camp to see a man who was supposed to be dying. I at once pulled on my boots, got some brandy, and ran down to the camp, where to my surprise and amusement, I found that it was my friend, Karen Bucks, who was at death's door. It was perfectly evident to me that he was only foxing, but when he asked for a dawa, or medicine, I told him gravely that I would give him some very good dawa in the morning. The next day at noon, when it was my custom to have evildoers brought up for judgment, I asked for Karim Box, but was told that he was too ill to walk. I, I accordingly ordered him to be carried to my boma, and in a few moments he'd arrived in his sharp way, which was shouldered by four coolies who, I could see, knew quite well that he was only shamming. There were also a score or so of his friends hanging around, doubtless waiting in the expectation of seeing the sahib hoodwinked. When the bed was placed on the ground near me, I lifted the blanket with which he had covered himself and thoroughly examined him, and at the same time feeling to make sure that he had no fever. He pretended to be desperately ill and again asked for a dawa, and having finally satisfied myself that it was, as the jamadar had said, pure bud mashi devilment, I told him that I was going to give him some very effective dawa, and carefully covered him up again, pulling the blanket over his head. I then got a big armful of shavings from a carpenter's bench, which was close by, and put them under the bed and set fire to them. As soon as the sham invalid felt the heat, he peeped over the edge of the blanket, and when he saw the smoke and flame leaping up around him, he threw the blanket from him, sprang from the bed, exclaiming, Baiman Shaitan, unbelieving devil, and fled like a deer, to the entrance of my boma, pursued by a Sikh sepoy, who got in a couple of good whacks with his shoulders with a sat stout stick before he effected his escape. His amused comrades greeted me with shouts of, Shabash Shah Sahib, well done, sir. And I never had any further trouble with Karim Bucks. He came back later in the day with clasped, clasped hands imploring forgiveness, which I readily granted as he was a clever workman. A few days after this incident, I was returning home one morning from a tree in which I had been keeping watch for the man-eaters during the previous night. Coming, coming unexpectedly to, on the quarry, I was amazed to find dead silence reigning, and my rascals of workmen all stretch out in the shade under the trees taking it very easy, some sleeping, some playing cards. I watched their proceedings through the bushes for a little while, then it occurred to me to give them a fright by firing my rifle over their heads. On the report being heard, the scene changed, changed like magic. Each man simply flew to his particular work, and hammers and chisels resounded merrily and energetically where all had been a silence a moment before. They thought, of course, that I was still some distance off and had not seen them, but to their consternation, 
I shouted to them that they were too late, as I had been watching them for some time. I find every man present heavily, besides summarily degrading the headman, who had thus shown himself utterly unfit for his position. I then proceeded to my hut, but had scarcely arrived there when two of the scoundrels, scoundrels tottered, tottered up after me, bent almost double in calling heaven to witness that I had shot them both in the back. In order to give a semblance of truth to an otherwise bald and unconvincing narrative, they had actually induced one of their fellow workmen to make a few holes like shot holes in their backs, and these were bleeding profusely. Unfortunately for them, however, I had been carrying a rifle and not a shotgun, and they had also forgotten to make corresponding holes in their clothing, so that all they achieved by this elaborate tissue of falsehood was to bring on themselves the derision of their comrades and the imposition of an extra fine. Shortly after this, when the Masons realized that I intended to make each man do a fair day's work for his money and would allow nothing to prevent this intention from being carried out, they came to the conclusion that the best thing to do would be to put me quietly out of the way. Accordingly, they held a meeting one night, all being sworn to secrecy, and after a long palaver, it was arranged that I was to be murdered the next day and I made my, as I made my usual visit to the quarry. My body was to be thrown into the jungle, where of course it would soon be devoured by wild beasts, and then they were to say that I had been killed and eaten by a lion. To this cheerful proposal, every man present at the meeting agreed, and affixed his finger mark to a long strip of paper as a binding token. Within an hour after the meeting had dispersed, however, I was aroused by one of the conspirators who had crept into my camp to give me warning. I thanked him for his information, but determined to go to the quarry in the morning all the same, as at this stage of affairs I really do not, did not believe that they were capable of carrying out such a diabolical scheme, and was rather inclined to think that the informant had been sent merely to frighten me. Accordingly, the next morning, September 6, I started off as usual along the trolley line to the lonely quarry. As I reached a bend in, my, in the line, my head mason, Hira Singh, a very good man, crept cautious, cautiously out of the bushes and warned me not to proceed. On my asking him the reason, he said that he dared not tell but that he and twenty other masons were not going to work that day, as they were afraid of trouble in the quarry. At this I began to think that there was something in the story I heard overnight, but laughingly assured him there would be no trouble and continued on my way. On my arrival at the quarry, everything seemed perfectly peaceful. All the men were working away busily, but after a moment or two I noticed stealthy side glances and felt there was something in the wind. As soon as I came up to the first gang of workmen, the Jemadar, a treacherous-looking villain, informed me that the men working further up the ravine had refused to obey his orders, and asked me if I would go and see them. I felt at once that this was a device to lure me into the narrow part of the ravine, where with gangs in front of me and behind me there would be no escape. Still I thought I would see the adventure through whatever came of it, so I accompanied the Jemadar up the gully. When we got to the further gang, he went so far as to point out the two men who, he said, had refused to do what he had told them. I suppose he thought that I was that I was never to leave the place alive. It did not matter whom he complained of. I noted their names in my pocketbook in my usual manner and turned to retrace my steps. Immediately, a yell of rage was raised by the whole body of some sixty men, answered by a similar shout from those I had first passed, who numbered about a hundred. Both groups of men, carrying crowbars and flourishing their heavy hammers, then closed in on me in the narrow part of the ravine, I stood still, waiting for them to act, and one man rushed at me, seizing both my wrists and shouting out that he was going to be hung and shot for me. Rather a curious way of putting it, but that was his exact expression. I easily wrenched my arms free and threw him from me, but by this time I was closely hemmed in, and everywhere I looked I could see nothing but evil and murderous-looking faces. One burly brute, afraid to be the first to deal a blow, hurled the man next to him at me, as if he had succeeded in knocking me down. I am certain that I should never have got up again alive. As it was, however, I stepped quickly aside, and the man intended to knock me down was himself thrown violently against a rock, over which he fell heavily. This occasions a moment's confusion, of which I quickly took advantage. I sprang on to the top of the rock, and before they had time to recover themselves, I had started haranguing them in Hindustani. The habit of obedience still held them, and fortunately they listened to what I had to say. I told them that I knew all about their plot to murder me, and that they could certainly do so if they wished. But if they did, many of them would assuredly be hanged for it, as the Sirkar government would soon find out the truth and would disbelieve their story that I had been carried off by a lion. 
I said I knew quite well that it was only one or two scoundrels among them who would induce them to behave so stupidly and urge them not to allow themselves to be made fools of in this way. Even supposing they were to carry out their plan of killing me, would not another sahib at once be sent over, set over them, and might not he be an even harder taskmaster? They all knew that I was just and fair to the real worker. It was only the scoundrels and shirkers who had anything to fear from me, and were upright, self-respecting. Pathans going to allow themselves to be led, oh, led away by men of this kind? Once having got to them to listen to me, I felt a little more secure, and I accordingly went on to say that the discontented among them would be allowed to return at once to Mombasa, while if the others resumed, resumed work and I heard of no further plotting, I would take no notice of their foolish conduct. Finally, I called upon those who were willing to return to work to hold up their hands, and instantly every hand in the crowd, crowd was raised. I then felt that, for the moment, the victory was mine, and after dismissing them, I jumped down from the rock and continued my rounds as if nothing had happened, measuring a stone here and there and commenting on the work done. They were still in a very uncertain and sullen mood, however, and not at all to be relied upon, so it was with feelings of great relief that an hour later I made my way back, safe and sound, to Savo. The danger was not yet past, unfortunately, for scarcely had I turned my back to go home when the mutiny broke out again, and another meeting being held, and a fresh plot made to murder me during the night. Of this I was soon informed by my timekeeper, who also told me that he was afraid to go out and call the roll, as they had threatened to kill him also. At this further outrage I lost no time in telegraphing for the railway police, and also to the district officer, Mr. Whitehead, who immediately marched his men twenty-five miles by road to my assistance. I have no doubt, indeed, that his prompt action alone saved me from being attacked that very night. Two or three days afterwards, the railway police arrived and arrested the ringleaders in the mutiny, who were taken to Mombasa and tried before Mr. Crawford, the British consul, when the full details of the plots to murder me were unfolded by one of them, who turned Queen's evidence. All the scoundrels were found guilty and sentenced to various terms of imprisonment in the chain gangs, and I was never again troubled with mutinous workmen. Chapter 6. The Reign of Terror The lion seemed to have got a bad fright the night Brock and I sat up and wait for them in the goods wagon, for they kept away from Savo and did not molest us in any way for some considerable time, not in fact until long after Brock had left me and gone on safari in Uganda. In this breathing space which they vouchsafed us, it occurred to me that, they sh that should they renew their attacks, a trap would perhaps offer the best chance of getting at them and that if I could construct one in which a couple of coolies might be used as bait without being subjected to any danger, the lions would be quite daring enough to enter in it in search of them, and thus be caught. I accordingly set to work at once, and in a short time managed to make a sufficiently strong trap out of wooden sleepers, tram rails, pieces of telegraph wire, and a length of heavy chain. It was divided into two compartments, one for the men and one for the lion. A sliding door at one end admitted the former, and once inside this compartment they were perfectly safe, as between them and the lion, if he entered the other, ran across a wall of iron rails only three inches apart, and embedded upon top them both, top and bottom, in heavy wooden sleepers. The door which was to admit the lion was, of course, in the opposite end of the structure, but otherwise the whole thing was very much on the principle of the ordinary rat trap, except that it was not necessary for the lion to seize the bait in order to send the door clattering down. This part of the contrivance was arranged in the following manner. A heavy chain was secured along the top part of the lion's doorway, the ends hanging down to the ground on either side of the opening, and to these were fastened, strongly secured by stout wire, short lengths of rails placed about six inches apart. This made a sort of flexible door which could be packed into a small space when not in use, and which abutted against the top of the doorway when lifted up. The door was held in this position by a lever made of a piece of rail, which in turn was kept in its place by a wire fastened to one end and passing down to a spring concealed on the ground inside the cage. As soon as the lion entered sufficiently far into the trap, he would be bound to tread on the spring. His weight on this would increase the wire, and in an instant down would come the door behind him, and he could not push it out in any way as it fell into a groove beneath, between two rails firmly embedded in the ground. In making this trap, which cost us a lot of work, we were rather at a loss for want of tools to bore holes in the rails for the doorway so as to enable them to be fastened by the wire to the chain. 
It occurred to me, however, that a hard-nosed bullet from my thirty odd thirty would penetrate the iron, and on making the experiment I was glad to find that a hole was made as cleanly as if it had been punched out. When the trap was ready, I pitched a tent over it in order to further deceive the, deceive the lions, and built an exceedingly strong boma around it. One small entrance was made at the back of the enclosure for the men, which they were to close on going in by pulling a bush after them, and another entrance just in front of the door of the cage was left open for the lions. The wise acres to whom I showed my invention were generally of the opinion that the man-eaters would be too cunning to walk into my parlor, but, as will, see, will be seen later, their predictions proved false. For the first few nights I baited the trap myself, but nothing happened except I had a very sleepless and uncomfortable time and was badly bitten by mosquitoes. As a matter of fact, it was some months before the lions attacked us again, though from time to time we heard of their depredations in other quarters. Not long after our night in the goods wagon, two men were carried off from Railhead, while another was taken from a place called Engomani, about ten miles away. Within a very short time, this latter place was again visited by the brutes, two more men being seized, one of whom was killed and eaten, and the other so badly mauled that he died within a few days. As I have said, however, we at Savo enjoyed complete immunity from attack, and the coolies, believing that their dreaded foes had permanently deserted the district, resumed all their usual habits and occupations, and life in the camps returned to its normal routine. At last we were suddenly startled out of this feeling of security. One dark night the familiar, terror-stricken cries and screams awoke the camps, and we knew that the demons had returned and had commenced a new list of victims. On this occasion, a number of men had been sleeping outside their tents for the sake of coolness, thinking, of course, that the lions had gone for good, when suddenly, in the middle of the night, one of the brutes was discovered forcing its way through the boma. The alarm was at once given, and sticks and stones and firebrands were hurled in the direction of the intruder. All was of no avail, however, for the lion burst into the midst of the terrified group, seized an unfortunate wretch amid the cries and shrieks of his companions, and dragged him off through the thick thorn fence. He was joined outside by the second lion, and so daring had the two brutes become that they did not trouble to carry their victim any further away, but devoured him within thirty yards of the tent where he had been seized. Although several, sh several shots were fired in their direction by the Jemadar of the gang to which the coolie belonged, they took no notice of these and did not attempt to move into their until their horrible meal was finished. The few scattered fragments that remained of the body I would not allow to be buried at once, hoping that the lions would return to the spot the following night, and on the chance of this I took up my station at nightfall in a convenient tree. Nothing occurred to break the monotony of my watch, however, except that I had a visit from a hyena, and the next morning I learned that the lions had attacked another camp about two miles from Tsavo, for by this time the camps were again scattered, as I had works in progress, progress all up and down the line. There the man-eaters had been successful in obtaining a victim, whom, as in the previous instance, they devoured quite close to the camp. How they forced their way through the bomas without making a noise was, and still is, a mystery to me. I should have thought that it was next to impossible for an animal to get through at all, yet they continually did so without a sound being heard. After this occurrence, I sat up every night for over a week near likely camps, but all in vain. Either the lion saw me and then went elsewhere, or else I was unlucky, for they took man after man from different places without ever once giving me a chance of a shot at them. This constant night watching was most dreary and fatiguing work, and I felt that it was a duty that had to be undertaken, as the men naturally looked to me for protection. In the whole of my life, I have never experienced anything more nerve-shaking than to hear the deep roars of these dreadful, dreadful monsters growing gradually nearer and nearer, and to know that some one or other of us was doomed to be their victim before morning dawned. Once they reached the vicinity of the camps, the roars completely ceased, and we knew that they were stalking for their prey. Shouts would then pass from camp to camp. Gabar, Dar, Baitan, Shaitan, Atta, beware, brothers, the devil is coming. But the warning cries would prove of no avail, and sooner or later the agonizing shrieks would break the silence, and another man would be missing from roll call the next morning. I was naturally very disheartened at being foiled in this way night after night, and soon at my wit's end to know what to do. It seemed that the lions really, were really devils after all, and bore a charmed life. As I have said before, tracking them through the jungle was a hopeless task, but as something that had to be done to keep up the men's spirits. I kept many a weary day crawling on my hands and knees 
through the dense undergrowth of the exasperating wilderness around us. As a matter of fact, if I had come up with the lines on any of these expeditions, it was much more likely that they would have added me to their list of victims than that I should have succeeded in killing either of them, as everything would have been in their favor. About this time, too, I had many helpers and several officers, civil, navy, naval, and military, come to Savo from the coast and sat up night after night in order to get a shot at our daring foes. All of us, however, met with the same lack of success, and the lions always seemed capable of avoiding the watchers while succeeding at the same time in obtaining a victim. I have a very vivid recollection of one particular night when the brute seized a man from the railway station and brought him close to my camp to devour. I could plainly hear them crunching the bones, and the sound of their dreadful purring filled the air and rang my ears for days afterwards. The terrible thing was to feel so helpless. It was useless to attempt to go out, as of course the poor fellow was dead. In addition, it was so pitch dark as to make it impossible to see anything. Some half a dozen workmen who lived in a small enclosure close to mine became so terrified on hearing the lions at their meal that they shouted and implored me to allow them to come inside my boma. This I willingly did, but soon afterwards I remembered that one man had been lying ill in their camp, and on making inquiry, I found that they had callously left him behind alone. I immediately took some men with me to bring him to my boma, but on entering his tent, I saw by the light of the lantern that the poor fellow was beyond need of safety. He had died of shock at being deserted by his companions. From this time, matters gradually became worse and worse. Hitherto, as a rule, only one of the man-eaters had made the attack and had done the foraging, while the other waited outside in the bush. But now they began to change their tactics, entering the bomas together and each seizing a victim. In this way, two Swahili porters were killed during the last week of November, one being immediately carried off and devoured. The other was heard moaning for a long time, and when his terrified companions at last summed up sufficient courage to go to his assistance, they found him stuck fast in the bushes of the boma, through which for once the lion had apparently been unable to drag him. He was still alive when I saw him next morning, but so terribly mauled that he died before he could be got to the hospital. Within a few days of this, the two brutes made a most ferocious attack on the largest camp in the section, for which safety's sake was situated within a stone's throw of Savo Station and close to a permanent way inspector's iron hut. Suddenly, in the dead of night, the two man-eaters burst in among the terrified workmen, and even from my boma, some distance away, I could plainly hear the panic-stricken shrieking of the coolies. Then followed cries of, They've taken him, they've taken him, as the brutes carried off their unfortunate victim and began their horrible feast close beside the camp. The inspector, Mr. Dalgarns, fired over fifty shots in the direction in which he heard the lions, but they were not to be frightened and calmly lay there until their meal was finished. After examining the spot in the morning, we at once set out to follow the brutes, Mr. Dalgarns feeling confident that he had wounded one of them as there was a trail on the sand like that of toes of a broken limb. After some careful stalking, we suddenly found ourselves in the vicinity of the lions and were greeted with ominous growlings. Cautiously advancing and pushing the bushes aside, we saw in the gloom what we at first took to be a lion cub. Closer inspection, however, showed it to be the remains of the unfortunate coolie, which the man-eaters had evidently abandoned at our approach. The legs, one arm, and half the body had been eaten, and it was the stiff fingers of the other arm trailing along the sand which had left the marks we had taken to be the trail of a wounded lion. By this time the beast had retired far into the thick jungle, where it was impossible to follow them, so we had the remains of the coolie buried, and once more returned home disappointed." Now the bravest men in the world, much less the ordinary Indian coolie, will not stand constant terrors of this sort indefinitely. The whole district was by this time thoroughly panic-stricken, and I was not at all surprised, therefore, to find on my return to camp that same afternoon, December 1st, that the men had all struck work and were waiting to speak to me. When I sent for them, they, they flocked to my boma in a body and stated that they would not remain at Savo any longer for anything or anybody. They had come from India on an agreement to work for the government, but not to supply food for either lions or devils. No sooner had they delivered this ultimatum than a regular stampede took place. Some hundreds of them stopped the first passing train by throwing themselves on the rails in front of the engine, and then swarming onto the tracks and throwing in their possessions anyhow, they fled from the accursed spot. <laughs> 
After this, the railway works were completely stopped, and for the next three weeks, practically nothing was done but build line-proof huts for those workmen who had had sufficient courage to remain. It was a strange and amusing sight to see these shelters perched on the top of water tanks, roofs, and girders, anywhere for safety, while some even went so far as to dig pits inside their tents, into which they descended at night, covering the top over with heavy logs of wood. Every good-sized tree in the camp had as many beds last on to it as as its branches would bear, and sometimes more. I can remember one night when the camp was attacked, so many men swarmed onto one particular tree that down it came with a crash, hurrying its terror-stricken load of shrieking coolies close to the very lions they were trying to avoid. Unfortunately for them, a victim had already been secured, and the brutes were too busy devouring him to pay attention to anything else. Chapter 7. The District Officer's Narrow Escape Some little time before the flight of the workmen, I had written to Mr. Whitehead, the district officer, asking him to come up and assist me in my campaign against the lions, and to bring with him any of his Askaris, or native soldiers, that he could spare. He replied accepting the invitation, and told me to expect him about dinner time on December 2nd, which turned out to be the day after the exodus. His train was due at Savo about 6 o'clock in the evening, so I sent up my boy to the station to meet him and to help in carrying his baggage to the camp. In a very short time, however, the boy rushed back trembling with terror and informed me there was no sign of the train or of the railway staff, but that an enormous lion was standing on the station platform. This extraordinary story I did not believe in the least, as by this time the coolies, never remarkable for bravery, were in such a state of fright that if they caught sight of a hyena or a baboon or even a dog in the bush, they were sure to imagine it was a lion. But I found out the next day that it was an actual fact, and that both station master and signal man had been obliged to take refuge from one of the man-eaters by locking themselves in the station building. I waited some little time for Mr. Whitehead, but eventually, as he did not put in an appearance, I concluded that he must have postponed his journey until the next day, and so had my dinner in my customary solitary state. During the meal, I heard a couple of shots, but paid no attention to them, as rifles were constantly being fired off in the neighborhood of the camp. Later in the evening, I went out as usual to watch for our elusive foes, and took up my position in a crib made of sleepers, which I had built on a big girder close to a camp which I thought was likely to be attacked. Soon after settling down to my post, I was surprised to hear the man-eaters growling and purring, and crunching up bones about seventy yards from the crib. I could not understand that what they had found to eat, as I had heard no commotion in the camps, but I knew by bitter experience that every meal the brutes obtained from us was announced by shrieks and, and uproar. The only conclusion I could come to was that they had pounced upon some poor, unsuspecting native traveler. After a time, I was able to make out their eyes glowing in the darkness, and I took as careful aim as possible in the circumstances and fired, but the only notice they paid to the shot was to carry off whatever they were devouring and to retire quietly over a slight rise, which prevented me from seeing them. There they finished their meal at their ease. As soon as it was daylight, I got out of my crib and went towards the place where I last heard them. On the way, whom should I meet but my missing guest, Mr. Whitehead, looking very pale and ill and generally disheveled. "'Where on earth have you come from?' I exclaimed. "'Why didn't you turn up to dinner last night?' A nice reception you gave a fellow when you invite him to dinner, was his only reply. Why, what's up, I asked. That infernal line of yours nearly did for me last night, said Whitehead. Nonsense. You must have dreamt it, I cried in astonishment. For answer, he turned round and showed me his back. That's not much of a dream, is it, he asked. His clothing was rent by one huge tear from the nape of the neck downwards, and on the flesh there were four great claw marks, showing red and angry though the lot through the torn cloth. Without further parley, I heard him off to my tent and bathed and dressed his wounds, and when I had made him considerably more comfortable, I got from him the whole story of the events of the night. It appeared that his train was very late, so that it was quite dark when he arrived at Savo Station, from which the track to my camp lay through a small cutting. He was accompanied by Abdullah, the sergeant of Askaris, who walked close behind him carrying a lighted lamp. All went well until they were about halfway through the gloomy cutting, when one of the lions suddenly jumped down upon them from the high bank, knocking Whitehead over like a ninepin, and tearing his back in the manner I had seen. Fortunately, however, he had his carbine with him, and instantly fired. 
The flash and the loud report must have dazed the lion for a second or two, enabling Whitehead to disengage himself, but the next instant the brute pounced like lightning on the unfortunate Abdullah with whom he at once made off. All that the poor fellow could say was, Eh, Buana, Simba, O oh, master, a lion. As the lion was dragging him over the bank, Whitehead fired again, but without effect, and the brute quickly disappeared into the darkness with his prey. It was, of course, this unfortunate man whom I had heard the lions devouring during the night. Whitehead himself had a marvelous escape. His wounds were happily not very deep and caused him little or no inconvenience afterwards. On the same day, December 3rd, the forces arrayed against the lions were further strengthened. Mr. Farquhar, the superintendent of police, arrived from the coast with a score of sepoys to assist in hunting down the man-eaters, whose fame had by this, by this time spread far and wide, and the most elaborate precautions were taken, his men being posted on the most convenient trees near every camp. Several other officials had also come up on leave to join in the chase, and each of these guarded a likely spot in the same way, Mr. Whitehead sharing my post inside the crib on the giant girder. Further, in spite of some chaff, my lion trap was put in thorough working order, and two of the sepoys were installed as bait. Our preparations were quite complete by nightfall, and we all took up our appointed positions. Nothing happened until about nine o'clock, when to my great satisfaction the intense stillness was suddenly broke by the noise of the door of the trap clattering down. At last I thought, one, of, one at least of the brutes had done for, but the sequel was an ignominious one. The bait, Sepoys had a lamp burning inside their part of the cage and were each armed with a martini rifle with plenty of ammunition. They had also been given strict orders to shoot at once if a lion should enter the trap. Instead of doing so, however, they were so terrified when he rushed in and began to lash himself madly against the bars of the cage that they completely lost their heads and were actually too unnerved to fire. <clears throat> not for some minutes, not indeed until Mr. Farquhar, whose post was close by, shouted at them and cheered them on, did they at all recover themselves. Then, when at last they did begin to fire, they fired with a vengeance, anywhere, anyhow. Whitehead and I were at right angles to the direction in which they should have shot, and yet their bullets came whizzling all around us. Altogether, they fired over a score of shots, and in the end succeeded in only in blowing away one of the bars of the door, just allowing, thus allowing our prize to make good his escape. How they failed to kill them several times over is, and always will be, a complete mystery to me, as they should, they could have put the muzzles of their rifles absolutely touching his body. There was indeed some blood scattered about the trap, but it was small consolation to know that the brute, whose capture and death seemed so certain, had only been slightly wounded. Still, we were not unduly dejected, and when morning came, a hunt was at once arranged. Accordingly, we spent the greater part of the day on our hands and knees following the lions through the dense thickets of thorny jungle. But though we heard their growls from time to time, we never succeeded in actually coming up with them. Of the whole party, only Farquhar managed to catch a momentary glimpse of one of it bounded over a bush. Two days more were spent in the same manner and with equal unsuccess. Then Farquhar and his sepoys were obliged to return to the coast. Mr. Whitehead also departed for his district and once again I was left alone with the man-eaters.